Good morning, River Cross, and happy Valentine's Day to you as we get to worship God this morning on Valentine's Day, which is so fitting because, you know, some of the most famous things that God did and God said had to do with God loving the world. And how perfect is that on a day like today where we celebrate so many things that have to do with that love. Thanks for joining in worship today. If you're visiting River Cross or trying to find out more about the church, we uh, encourage you to go to our website, but we also want to tell you that we talk about the church in terms of stepping in. That's because we believe that God has stepped in first to a relationship with us. In 1 John, it talks about the fact that God loved us first, and we therefore love each other. And that's so much of what God does all the time, that God does things first, God steps in first, that causes us to then step into a relationship with God. We talk about doing that through worshiping, connecting, and serving. Worshiping God, connecting with each other, and serving those around us. We hope you can be part of that in whatever ways are possible, and we keep inventing and creating new ways to be able to step into a relationship with God. We're doing that this coming week through a prayer call on Wednesday morning at 9. If you can join us for that, you're welcome to dial in. Anybody is and be able to pray together for 30 minutes. We are also studying the Bible together on a Zoom Bible study from 7 to 7.45 on Thursday evenings. We're doing it every Thursday, and anybody is welcome. We encourage you, uh, join in, even if you've never joined in before. You can join in to that Bible study on Zoom. Next Sunday, the uh, 21st, we are celebrating the beginning of Lent. Uh, Ash Wednesday is this coming Wednesday, but we're celebrating it on Ash Sunday. So we'll be having a chance to be together, but also to be able to have a cross put on our forehead of ashes, as is traditionally done, as a way of marking the beginning of the season and marking our dependence on Jesus for the forgiveness that he gives us. We'll give some more details about how that can work work in person in a safe way that we'll be doing uh, after in the late morning on the 21st, but we're also going to make it available to everybody by sending some things to you. So look in the mail for some things this coming week to be able to make that work for you and for everybody else. We also have some other treats to be able to celebrate the season of Lent and some ways to do that through reading the Bible, studying the Bible, and growing in a relationship with God all at the same time and all in the same way. It's good to know that we're doing it together so we're going to send those things out to everybody this week. Uh, thanks again for joining in worship. And now as we begin to worship, we are going to begin with a moment of silence to prepare ourselves for the things that God may be saying to us today and the things that we need to learn from God. So let's join in a minute of silence together. When things aren't fair, when people don't treat us well, or when there is conflict, certain people become our enemies. Hundreds of times in the Bible, people talk about their enemies, and most of the time they pray that God would come to the rescue. Here is King David praying in Psalm 17. O Lord, hear my plea for justice. Listen to my cry for help. Pay attention to my prayer, for it comes from honest lips. I have followed your commands, which keep me from following cruel and evil people. My steps have stayed on your path. I have not wavered from following you. I am praying to you because I know you will answer, O God. Bend down and listen as I pray. Show me your unfailing love in wonderful ways. By your mighty power, you rescue those who seek refuge from their enemies. Guard me as you would guard your own eyes. Hide me in the shadow of your wings. By the power of your hand, O Lord, destroy those who look to this world for their reward, but satisfy the hunger of your treasured ones. This is the word of the Lord. I could have 
Confessing our sins helps us have pure hearts and good relationships with God. Please join me and let's confess together. Almighty God, you want us to have an abundant life where we enjoy a relationship with you. We confess, however, that we have taken your way of life and made it into rules to follow. We admit that we criticize people who don't follow your way, even when we don't either. We fail to pray earnestly for your power to overcome temptations. Lead us to love your way more than our own and to encourage our families and friends. Amen. God loved us first so that we can see how to love God and love each other. In God's love, there is forgiveness, healing, and hope for new things between both God and us. Praise God for his good gifts in Jesus. Amen. Games are often a lot of fun. A lot of us enjoy different types of games, you know, board games or activity games or card games or outside games or even inside games, team games, individual games. We love games. Lots of us play different kinds of games. But when we're learning a new kind of game, it seems like who we really are comes out. When you're learning a game, I wonder which way you do it. Are you the kind of person who, when you're learning a, a new game and you're opening the box for the first time that you take out the board and you take out the pieces and you set it all up and you just start playing. And if you encounter a problem or something that you don't really know how to do, maybe you just then start to figure it out. Maybe you pull out the book and start reading a rule or a way to play the game to address the problem or figure out what to do. But you just start playing the game and then you figure it out as you go. Or are you the kind of person who, when you open up the box for the first time, you take out that thing that's on top and you read it cover to cover? You read the rules. You look at all the rules, you figure out all the rules, you figure out how the whole game is played and what the object is, and then you actually start to play the game. Are you the rules person or are you the person who just likes to jump in and start playing? I mean, we, we need both. We need the rule followers and we need the just jump in and do it and figure it out as you go. We surely need both, but it's two completely different ways of looking at how to play a game. How does it work when it comes to faith? How do the rules work when it comes to a relationship with God? I mean, do we read the rules and follow all the rules and figure out how the game is played, and then we strive with all our might to follow the rules as we go through in order to play the game successfully? Or do we just kind of ignore the rules and toss the book to the side, and maybe if there's a problem, we address the rules and we figure out what the rules say, but for the most part, we don't really need the rules because that's not what it's necessarily all about. Which way does it work? Well, we know if we open up the Bible that there are a lot of rules. I mean, God gave as one of the first major things God did was to give the Ten Commandments. And everybody knows the Ten Commandments. Everybody, even who people who don't follow God at all, know about the Ten Commandments. They're some of the ten most formative rules that God gave. Well, if we keep turning the pages through that part of the Bible, we find how many hundreds of other rules there really are that God gave. Rules that people strive to follow and rules that God gave them to say, this is the best life that I want for you. So many different rules that God gave. And it seems like that when people followed the rules, as we read through the Bible, when people followed the rules, God was happy. But when people didn't follow the rules, God was angry. And so it kind of goes without saying that the goal was to follow the rules that God gave. That's so logical way to look at things. But then if we go further into the Bible, we see that when Jesus came, Jesus looked at things a little differently. When it came to how to live and the priorities of living, Jesus talked a whole lot about loving God and loving others, about loving our neighbors, about being compassionate and generous, about being kind to others and being forgiving. And Jesus lived that way, and Jesus extended all that to other people too. And Jesus talked not so much about rules, nor did he tell people that they were doing the wrong thing all the time. Jesus talked a whole lot more about loving other people. So which is it? When we look at a Bible or we look at a relationship with God or we even try to live in a relationship with God, which way do we go? Do we read the rules and follow all the rules and that's the way to do it? Or do we 
look more at the love end of things and we figure out, well, how do I love people regardless of the rules? We've been on a search for the high road for the last several weeks. The high road in terms of the kinds of choices and the kinds of decisions for how to live and how to behave and what to do and what not to do that Jesus gives us. We've been looking through this section in the book of Matthew of Jesus teaching. It's his longest segment of teaching that we have. And it's called famously the Sermon on the Mount. And it's called that because Jesus went up on a mountain and he gave this teaching. And as he did go up on that mountain, he also leads and calls us high road, this higher standard of how to live and how to follow God. And he gives us all kinds of ways of looking at what a relationship with God is and how a relationship with God works and what it means to get on the high road in terms of following God. So when it comes to the high road that Jesus is talking about, Jesus talks a lot about the rules and how they relate to a relationship with God and how all that fits together and how that works. And Jesus discusses rules and Jesus discusses love and he discusses how this all fits. So let's see what Jesus says. Don't misunderstand why I have come. I did not come to abolish the law of Moses or the writings of the prophets. No, I came to accomplish their purpose. I tell you the truth. Until heaven and earth disappear, not even the smallest detail of God's law will disappear until its purpose is achieved. So if you ignore the least commandment and teach others to do the same, you will be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But anyone who knows God's laws and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. But I warn you, unless your righteousness is better than the righteousness of the teachers of religious law and the Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. So what do you think? Is Jesus a rules guy or is Jesus not a rules guy? Is Jesus all about the rules and following and making sure they're all right? Or does Jesus just toss the rules aside and say, let's go for another direction? Well, Jesus is pretty intense, it seems, about the rules. He brings it up quite a number of times, even in that short section, but he also says something else. He said that he's not interested in getting rid of the rules. He's interested in the rules accomplishing their purpose. It's as if he's saying the, ru the rules haven't yet accomplished their purpose. What? what? What does that mean, that they haven't accomplished their purpose? I mean, think about it. Think about the rules of a game. What are the rules of a game for? Rules of a sport, or rules of a board game, or rules of a board or a game that you play. What are the rules for? Well, they're to tell us how to play. They're to tell us how not to play. They're to tell us how to play fair. They're to make sure that there's a safe place to be able to play and a safe way to be able to play the game. Now, what happens in a game if you follow the rules? Well, you get to play the game. What happens if you break the rules? Well, sometimes you get kicked out of the game, or you get punished, or in some other way, you just don't really get to play the game like you used to be able to. You don't get to play. Well, think about it in terms of faith. Is it the same way? God gave all these rules, the Ten Commandments and hundreds of other rules to be able to follow, so it should go the same way, right? If we follow the rules, then things are good with a relationship with God. We follow the rules, God's happy, and God, we're living the way that God wants us to live. We get to keep on playing God's game. But what happens if we break the rules? Well, we might get punished, there might be a consequence, or worse yet, we get kicked out of the game. Well, this is how lots of people looked at following the rules for a long time after God gave them. That it was all about following the rules. And if we follow the rules, things go well. If we break the rules, things don't go so well. And they developed these elaborate systems for how to follow the rules because it was all about following the rules. They developed explanations for what the rules meant. And so if the rules were, say, this much, the explanations were this much. And then they developed scenarios for, well, what if this happens? Or what if this happens? And those explanations may be filled this much. So their systems got more complex. And their explanations got longer. And the people involved got 
more numerous. And it even got to the point where there were some people who were punishers of people who didn't follow the rules. And there were other people that judged whether or not you followed the rules or not. And there were even other people who developed systems and ways that you could graduate from one level to another of following the rules, and you could become a great rule follower. And that's how following the rules went. Then Jesus came. And Jesus looked at this, and Jesus said, that's not the purpose of the rules. That's not why God gave the rules. It's not about just following the rules. They have not yet accomplished their purpose. Well, what do you mean they haven't yet accomplished their purpose? Of course they've accomplished their purpose. I mean, the rules tell us what to do and what not to do, and we're all about that. We have a system, we have people, we have strategies, we have consequences, we have punishments, we have rewards, we have all the things that we need in order to follow the rules. That's what the rules have done, and that's what the rules are doing. So of course they've accomplished their purpose. But Jesus says, no, I came so that they can accomplish their purpose. So what's he talking about? Well, think about God's laws. I mean, we know some of God's laws. Uh, have no other gods before me. Worship God alone. Uh, keep the Sabbath. Honor your father and mother. Don't steal. Don't murder. Don't lie. Don't ruin relationships. Don't want what other people have. There are lots of laws, and there are hundreds beyond those. So how easy is it to keep those rules? How easy is it to obey all those rules all the time? Well, there have been some pretty amazing people. I mean, think about it in the day when God gave the rules. There was Moses, and later on there was King David, and there was Mary, the mother of Jesus, and there was King Solomon, and there was uh, Mother Teresa more recently, or Billy Graham. I mean, there were some amazing people, some people who are highly admired and highly respected and highly faithful in so many ways. Did all of them keep all of God's rules perfectly all the time? Well, no. Of course they didn't. Why? Because nobody can. Nobody can keep God's rules all the time. Well, hold on. How does that work? How does it work to play a game or to follow a way where the rules are impossible to keep? I mean, would you ever open up a brand new board game or start a new sport where you knew the rules, but you realize after playing it for a while that it's impossible to follow all the rules all the time. Even the most seasoned, the most expert, the most trained, the most smart or wise person couldn't keep all those rules all the time. Would you play the game anymore if that was the case? I mean, how much fun would that be if you could never play the game well because you could never follow the rules? It would be impossible. Is that what God is doing by setting up the rules that God gave us for following him? Is God said, here's this set of rules, and let me tell you, it's impossible to follow them. Surely the rules have a more important thing to teach us than the fact that it's just impossible to follow the rules. Well, they do. And Jesus hints toward it that there's a greater purpose that Jesus came to fulfill in the rules that God gave. So to figure that out, let's look at this. You're most likely familiar with the Ten Commandments in the Bible, stuff we generally take as good advice. Don't murder, don't steal, honor your parents, the list goes on. And those are just the first ten. There are actually a total of 613 commands, all given to ancient Israel, found in the first five books of the Bible, which in Hebrew are called the Torah. Now the word Torah is usually translated in English as the law, because it has all of these laws in it. And as you read through them, you wonder, Am I supposed to obey some of these, all of these? I mean, what's the purpose of the law? Well, that translation is kind of confusing because while the Torah has laws in it, the book itself is fundamentally a story about how God is creating new kinds of people who are fully able to love God and love others. And when Jesus taught about the Torah, he said that he was bringing that story to its fulfillment. So walk me through the story and how it's fulfilled. So the story begins with God creating humanity who rebels. And God chooses Abraham to bless all of the nations through his family, who end up in slavery down in Egypt, and so God rescues them. Then at Mount Sinai, God makes a covenant with Israel, like an agreement. And all of the laws that Moses gives to Israel are the terms of that agreement. They're like a constitution. And so some of the laws, they're about rituals and customs that set Israel apart from the nations. 
Other laws are about social justice or morality, and by following these, Israel would show the other nations what God is like. Okay, so the rest of the Torah is just the complete list of laws that Moses gives Israel? Mm, No, the rest of the Torah just continues the story. And the 613 commands are only a selection from that original constitution. And even these have been broken up and placed at strategic points within the story. Now pay attention because you'll see a really clear pattern. Moses gives the first laws to Israel. Don't worship other gods, don't make idols. And then right after that, there's a story of Israel breaking those very laws. Yeah, they worship the golden calf. And so Moses gives some more laws, and then you get more stories of rebellion. Some more laws, rebellion again, some more laws, more rebellion, and you start to see the point. Right, no matter how many laws, they're just going to continue to rebel. So at the conclusion of the Torah's story, Moses gives this final speech to Israel as they prepare to go into their new home. And he tells them, you guys, I know that you're not going to follow all of God's laws. You've proven to me that you're incapable. And Moses says the problem is that their hearts are hard and that they're going to need new transformed hearts if they're ever going to truly follow God's law. And he was right. I mean, the story goes on to recount Israel's total failure. They go into the land. They break all the laws. Right. Now, the next section of books in the Jewish tradition are the 15 books of the prophets, and they reflect back on the story. For example, Ezekiel, he said that if Israel was ever going to obey the law, God's spirit would have to transform their hard hearts into soft hearts. And Jeremiah said that's when obedience to God's commands wouldn't feel like a duty, but they would be written deep in their hearts. And Isaiah, he promised a future leader, Israel's Messiah, who will lead all of the people in obedience to the law. Now, in Jewish tradition, all of these books together are called the prophets, even the historical books, because they're continuing the story told from the perspective of the prophets. Okay, so we have the law and the prophets, and they're telling one connected story about God's desire to bless the whole world through a people, Israel, who it turns out needs a new heart. Yes, and Jesus saw himself as continuing that story. So he agreed with the law and the prophets when he taught that it's out of the human heart that come the most ugly parts of human nature. It's like the default setting of our hearts is opposed to God's law. But Jesus also said that he came to solve that problem, and in his words, to fulfill the law. So what does he mean there, to fulfill the law? Well, first he said that the demand of all of the laws in the Torah could be fulfilled by what he called the great command, that we are to love God and to love others. So that seems pretty easy. I mean, we all want to love. Well, we think we want to love. But Jesus showed how love is far more demanding than we realize. So he quotes the law, do not murder. And he says, yes, not killing someone is a very loving thing to do. But then he also says that when you treat someone with disrespect or when you nurse resentment against them, you're also violating God's moral ideal because you're not treating that person with love. And so Jesus said true love ought to extend even to our own enemies. So even though this command seems very simple, Jesus showed how our hearts are not currently equipped to fulfill even this basic command of God to love others. And that's kind of a downer. But where Israel failed, Jesus brought this story to its fulfillment. As Israel's Messiah, he fully loved God and others, and he showed all of the nations what God is truly like. He did this through his acts of compassion and mercy, and ultimately by loving his enemies even unto death. And after his resurrection, he told his followers that he would send God's Spirit to transform their hearts so that they could follow him and fulfill the purpose of the law, to love God and to love their neighbor. So this fulfills the story of the law and the prophets, or in the words of the Apostle Paul, the one who loves fulfills the law. Our hearts are not equipped to follow God's rules. That's what the Bible teaches us, that in the hardness of our hearts, in the way that we are by ourselves, our hearts are not in the right condition to be able to follow God's rules all the time. We have a wrong heart condition, and there's something that needs to change. It's not that the rules need to be repaired or replaced. It's that our hearts need to be redeemed. And that's what the Bible talks about. In the book of Romans, it says this, The law of Moses was unable to save us because of the weakness of our sinful nature. In other words, we aren't capable of following the rules because our heart is not conditioned for it. 
It continues, so God did what the law could not do. He sent his own son in a body like the bodies we sinners have. And in that body, God declared an end to sin's control over us by giving his son as a sacrifice for our sins. He did this so that the just requirement of the law would be fully satisfied for us, who no longer follow our sinful nature, but instead follow the Spirit. In other words, God repaired our hearts through Jesus so that we could see the purpose for God's rules and following those rules. As we strive to follow those rules, we discover more and more that we can't follow them and we need help. And as we follow those rules, we continue to show others what it means and what it looks like to be able to strive after God. So back to the original question, do we need the rules? In, G- in Jesus' terms, does Jesus think that we need the rules anymore? Well, let's go back and let's look exactly what Jesus said and see if that's true. Do we need the rules or do we not? I tell you the truth, Jesus said, until heaven and earth disappear, not even the smallest detail of God's law will disappear until its purpose is achieved. So if you ignore the least commandment and teach others to do the same, you will be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But anyone who obeys God's laws and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. But I warn you, Unless your righteousness is better than the righteousness of the teachers of religious law and the Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. So it doesn't sound like Jesus is saying, get rid of the rules. It sounds like Jesus is saying the opposite, like step up the requirement, like this is a bigger deal than it's ever been before. I mean, he says, don't ignore the rules. And then he says, even teach others to follow these rules. And he says, even you have to be more obedient and more rule following than even the best of the best rule followers that are there anywhere. I think Jesus is serious about following the rules because the more that we follow these rules, the more we discover that we can't follow the rules and that we need help in following the rules. And at the same time, the more we follow the rules, the more we point God out to others and to what God is like. See, Jesus is calling us to the high road. Jesus is calling us perhaps to the highest of the high roads, because anything less is not what God wants for us. Anything less is not going to discover why we need Jesus. Anything less is not going to teach us about who we really are and who God is and what a relationship with God looks like. So if there are decisions before us and there are challenges before us and rules to follow before us and we know God's rules and we read God's rules, every time we look at those rules or those ways that God wants us to live, it's a challenge for God, from God to us to be able to say, what should I decide here and what does this then teach me about a relationship with God and a need for Jesus? I mean, Jesus came so that we might discover more and more about who God is and more and more about what a relationship with God is like. And the more that we get on the high road, the more that we make those high road kinds of choices, those hard choices, those choices that challenge us and those choices that are difficult to make and are according to the ways of God, the more we're going to discover who God is and the more we get to show others what God is like. So the next time that you're encountered with a choice or a decision or you even read a rule and come across a rule or hear a rule that God has, it's an opportunity to be able to learn about God, learn about Jesus, and learn about what it means to live the life that God made for you and for me to be able to live. Would you pray with me? God, thank you for holding us to a high standard and inviting us onto a high road. Would you lead us there in all the decisions and all the ways that we can? Lord, if it's decisions or ways to treat other people or personal decisions we make for ourselves or habits to get into or habits to avoid or things that we might be able to do to, to, to be faithful or to live with integrity or however it is, God, lead us to live those kinds of decisions that point us toward the high road and point us to Jesus. Lord, may it be that as we live that others might even discover too and long after and wonder after the way that you call us to live so that they might see who Jesus is, the life that God made us for, and how a relationship with God can work for them. So we pray together in the way that Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts 
as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. sure to check your mail this week for ways that we can celebrate.
celebrate together the beginning of the season of Lent that will begin on Ash Wednesday, and we'll be celebrating that on Ash Sunday together. Hope to be able to see you next week for Ash Sunday at 11 o'clock. Otherwise, there will be some things in the mail that will help you to be able to celebrate Lent uh, all together and things that we can all do at the same time. We're also praying this week at 9 o'clock on Wednesday morning, or we're studying the Bible on Zoom on Thursday evening, and we're continuing to think ahead and plan ahead for what we might be able to do at Easter. So we'll keep on spreading the word and the details about that as they come available. Thank you for sharing Rivercross and the things that we get to do with others, uh, both near and far. These are great opportunities to be able to share Jesus with others by uh, sharing the things that we can do together as a church. So friends, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face toward you and give you his peace. Amen. Amen.